Hello sailors, this is the Dodger Kebab and Sony has a history of encouraging bedroom programmers to create games for PlayStation. And they're still doing it. Let's have a butchers. Back in the mid 1980s, the world of video games was very different. In America, it was all about games consoles. Atari had just caused the American games market to crash well with this. Who wants to play that shit? I need to shoot some news. And then Nintendo swooped in to rescue the market with actual good games. In Japan, the video game market was huge. So while Nintendo was selling a lot of Famicoms, Microsoft and Sony were also selling a lot of MX home computers. Meanwhile, in the UK, almost the entire market was dominated by home computers like the godlike ZX Spectrum and the vastly inferior Commodore 64. But what's this got to do with anything. Well, in areas where home computing was popular, so was the one-man bedroom coder. The lone guy staying up all night on cheap amphetamines, writing his own games for his computer, with the hope that he could sell them to a publisher like so many others were doing at the time. The home coding culture gave birth to some of the greatest studios that continue to this day. Rare, Rockstar, Codemasters were all born from this era of do-it-yourself gaming. As the crazy 80s came to an end and the 90s hit like a bad come down, home computers were old news. Video games were dominated by just two console manufacturers, Sega and Nintendo, neither of which sold machines that allowed for home programming. It looked like if you wanted to make your own games, it would be on a boring beige box. But then, in the mid-90s, Sony came along, completely steamrolled both Sega and Nintendo with a console of their own. Plus, not only did it have fantastic games, but Sony had a vision of once again bringing back the bedroom coder and fostering a new generation of games developers. This is the part of the story that many people know. As well as the retail PlayStations that anyone could buy and play games on, Sony also created a special PlayStation called the Net Yorose. Yorose translates from Japanese and it means let's do it together. But this was not some sort of 90s sexual tinderbox. This was a PlayStation that you could actually write your own games for. You had to buy these directly from Sony. And although they were available worldwide, they were most popular in the UK and Japan, where a culture of home programming had been alive and well just a decade before. Between seeing the games or talking about technical details, I know what you want me to show next. Now, you can find these games online, but if you're super desperate to find official versions of these games, you're going to need to go on eBay and hunt down the old UK PlayStation Magazine demo discs, as these always used to feature Eurose games on them. Anyway, let's look at some gems swimming in turds. The first thing that springs to mind when you think about homebrew games is cheap knockoffs and that's Columns by PRG. Obviously a copy of the Mega Drive Classic, obviously not as good. But then you have Blitter Boy that is actually good. Collect the babies and bring them back to the middle while shooting the mobs. Great fun and a really well done homebrew game. You also have the fantastic Hover Racing which runs really well and is a simply brilliant effort for a homebrew PS1 game. This actually runs better than some full price games on other systems at the time, like Checkered Flag on the Atari Jaguar, which runs and plays like absolute dog shit. But you have home coders on PS1 making superior games. Maybe you'd rather play a shooter. If that's the case, then the appointed station is the game for you. It's frankly unbelievable that this is a homebrew game coded for the PS1. But it's not all smiles and rainbows. You have titles like a 
adventure game, which is just a vomit-inducing mix of confusing world layouts and a control system that is only partially related to the buttons you are pressing on the controller. These are all games that found their way to demo discs, but what about the shit that Sony wouldn't even waste your time with? For that, we can go on the internet and download games from the Eurose forums, like 3D Dragon Pasta, which to be fair, is actually much better than Adventure Game by quite a huge margin. It's not especially deep, but it's far more playable. But we can dive further than this. What about clone games that actually had effort put in? Well, for that, we have Fatal Fantasy 7. A group of Japanese guys decided to make their own homage to the Squaresoft classic using actual PlayStation hardware. And they've actually done quite a brilliant job. But don't get too excited, as this is probably one of the first examples of early access games. It's only about four rooms and only a little bit of running around and talking to NPCs before it ends with a coming soon screen. It never came, but what did happen was members of Team Fatal who actually made this ended up going to work for Squaresoft. This guy is even still at Square and directed a couple of the Crystal Chronicle games. Before we end this section, I think it's only right to mention the biggest success to come from the Eurose, and that's Sire, or Devil Dice as it was called in the West. This was a Eurose game that Sony liked so much that they officially published the game as a standalone release. Don't ask me how you play this because I still don't understand it. But lots of Japanese people must have liked this because on top of the standard release, there was also the special edition, then a PS2 version, a PSP version, a free demo of the PS1 version as a PS3 digital store game, and even a Wonderswan version. Yep, that's an officially licensed Sony game on the Wonderswan, although only in Japan. So that was Sony's official homebrew setup for the PS1, but what did they offer for their next system? The PlayStation 2 in the year 2000 was powerful, very powerful. The biggest selling gaming console in history and now each console can become a homebrew tool as all you needed was the Linux kit and the PS2 that you already owned. You didn't need a whole new console model like what you did with the Net Eurose so you can imagine just how much quality homebrew is out there for the PS2. Turns out, very little actually. I found an archive repository from the main community hub at the time, and it's mainly graphic demos, application ports, and some very basic pieces of software. Maybe it was the idea of Linux programming that didn't excite people. Maybe it was the parallel computing architecture that put people off. Or maybe it was the pitiful 40 meg of fucking RAM that the PS2 had that turned people away. Whatever the reason, nothing really noteworthy came Came from the PS2 Linux setup, but before we look at the PS3, there is one little detail to mention just because of the topic of this video, and it's your boy, yeah, basic. When Sony first launched the PS2 in European territories, they bundled in a copy of YA Basic on a disc as a way to dodge an EU 2% tax that games consoles were subject to, but home computers were not. Yeah, have fun typing in lines of code on a fucking joypad. Although, years later, the famous hacker Cter found an exploit which he used the YA basic so thanks only With the release of the PS3, you no longer needed a special kit to install Linux. It was a feature that was actually built into the firmware. I know, because I installed Yellow Dog Linux on my PS3, although Sony nerfed the whole thing by cutting off the GPU when Linux was running. It looked like, for a while, this would be the same dead end as what we had with the PS2. Amazingly, it was actually worse than that, because after the hacker Geohot said he found a way to bring the GPU back online via 
via Linux, Sony shut the whole thing down and removed the Linux feature from the PS3 altogether. But it turned out we didn't need Linux. We got something better, something anyone could use, even with no programming knowledge whatsoever. We got Little Big Planet, a fantastic platform game from Sony first party studio, Media Molecule. Not only was this game a ton of fun to play through, but it also came with a brilliantly crafted level editor. This meant you could create your own platform style games, but not just platform games. If you really thought about how to use the tools in creative ways, you could fashion puzzle games and arcade style games too. But Little Big Planet 1's editor wasn't enough. It was still quite limiting if you wanted to create games from different points of view or game styles that were outside what the editor allowed. So it wasn't really a substitute for a proper development environment. That is where Little Big Planet 2 came in. While the main game offered a whole host of new levels to play, it was the editor that had been seriously improved, now allowed for all sorts of different styled games to be made. With the release of Little Big Planet 3, almost anything was possible, so long as you really knew how to push the editor. The community made pinball games, animations, and all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't expect to be possible in this title. What you have to remember with the Little Big Planet series is that not only were you given the tools to make your own games, but now you also had the means to share them with a huge number of people, including people already working in the games industry. And that is where Little Big Planet far and away exceeds what was possible with just having Linux as an option on the PS3. Little Big Planet acted as a platform for users to get their creations seen by hundreds of thousands of people. It was because of how easy it was to get your work seen that led to people getting actual jobs in the games industry off the back of their work in Little Big Planet. The idea Sony had with the PlayStation as fostering new talent into the industry was now now truly open to anyone, but it would be with a PlayStation 4 that fully delivered on that dream. And just before we get into the PS4, we need to talk about the little handheld that even Sony forgot about, and that's the PlayStation Vita. Being an owner of one of these wonderful handhelds, I still remember the day I scanned the store and found a download called PlayStation Mobile Development Assistant. It sounded cool, so I downloaded it and then started searching on the internet to what it was about. It turns out that Sony is once again planning to give home coders the ability to develop games for their hardware. So what I downloaded was the software needed for the Vita to make it accept anything that you'd built on the PlayStation Mobile SDK for the PC. Not being able to write program code made it pretty useless to me, but to others it was important. These people spoke to each other on the special forum that Sony had set up, which I've archived here. Now you may be wondering if anything actually came from this. Well yes actually it did, and the best example of this is a game called Super Crate Box. This was developed using the PlayStation Mobile SDK and then put out for public release. Although the PlayStation Vita as a platform didn't last that long, so neither did the mobile SDK studio. The PlayStation 4, and by extension of backwards compatibility, the PlayStation 5 2, is the home to the current PlayStation official homebrew setup. Dreams is a full fat game creation studio with powerful tools that have been made simple and easy to use. No longer do people need to find creative ways around the Little Big Planet editor to make what they want. Now they're just given the tools from the word go. You can make interactive animations, show off your skills as an artist, or build any sort of game you want. Racing games, platform games, shooters, anything you can think of. So let's take a look at some of the games people have made. Kuro, A Shadow's Dream is a fantastic action platform game with a beautiful art style that controls just as great as it looks. Metal Eagles is an arcade shooter very much in the style of Capcom's 1941. A lot of work has gone into making the graphics and the creator has done a great job of making a good looking fun shoot em up. Omi Kart looks like a Mario Kart clone but in reality it controls and feels more like Hydro Thunder which is definitely not a bad thing. So imagine Midway's game with weapons and a fantasy setting. 
Pip the Gem Walker is a charming little puzzle platformer. X's mark the spots where the gems are buried and you must look around the mini levels in a Captain Toad sort of manner trying to locate them. Sonic Dreams Edition is a fan made Sonic game which is okay. To be fair, actual Sonic team have made worse efforts than this in the past as full price games. Starfighter Gemini is an arcade shoot em up with more modern graphics. Not really much to add to that apart from that this plays great and could easily be released as a standalone title for a budget price. What are also great to see is games that really feel like they were made by just one person with a fun idea. No matter if it's a simple one button concept like Don't Let Grandpa See where you just have to swap between doing homework and playing PlayStation. If Grandpa sees you playing PlayStation then it's game over. Or this game which is called The Last Piece of Toilet Paper which is set during the time of toilet paper shortages and you play as the last roll of toilet paper and you need to avoid the viruses and get to the end of the level. These games really harp back to the early home computer days of wild experimentation when anyone could make anything just because they had the tools to do so. Like Little Big Planet before it, Dreams has provided people with a platform to get their creations seen by many and like Little Big Planet, creators are finding careers in the games industry. So to come back around, Sony's plan of the PlayStation keeping the 80s home coding scene alive has been delivered. They have released a development studio with a distribution method for games creation that is open to everyone, even if you have no prior experience. I'm just surprised it's not just an endless amount of penises.